This episode was sponsored by NFT Ventures Miami. Join the NFTV mailing list for the sickest drops. Welcome back to the World Crypto Network. Today we're joined by Yulia Babanova, an mm -hmm. NFT artist. How's it going, Yulia? I'm really good. How are you? <laughs> Doing good. Always glad to talk about NFTs and see what's going on out there. Uh, so let's just ask you first some really basic questions. How did you first hear about NFTs? Uh, well, it was at September last year and I was just at the party and one guy was like, I was talking to him and I was like, yeah, like I'm an artist. And he was like, okay, how do you sell your art? And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's not that easy because not right now it's a lockdown. So all the shows were canceled, like my solo show was canceled and you can't travel around. So he was like, yeah, but there is this website where you can sell like your, the tokens of your art. And I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. So at that moment, I think it was like super rare. So NFTs were selling for $200, $300. And um, yeah, I was like, I looked into that and I was thinking, wow, it's interesting. But I didn't really dive deep into technology behind it. So I didn't understand how much potential it got. So I so you actually were, like you were interested right away. You didn't think it was yeah. a scam or anything. You didn't say mm. a lot of people hear about it and they're like, no, I'm not getting into that. But you, you thought it was interesting right away. huh? Yeah, because uh, before that I was, you know, like selling some prints on Etsy and I was like, well, it's like Etsy, but better because you have like, <laughs> you get like more decent money for the work that you do. Um, but yeah, I didn't research the technology that well, like I knew about Ethereum and Bitcoin like long before that, but I didn't research NFT technology. So it took me like a few months until I realized what's behind it. And when I researched all of it, like I was like, wow, okay, this is really cool. It's, it's quite an interesting idea that you might get more money for a non-real piece. Like on mm. Etsy, you'd actually have to mail them the art piece, right? Yeah. It's a yeah. physical thing. Whereas this, you could make, say, 10 of them, sell nine of them, make mm -hmm. more money and still own an original for yourself. It's a very interesting process, huh? Yeah, I think it's very empowering for the artists. Uh, it like I can see so many people succeeding in the space. I mean, right now it's a bit like there are a lot of people, so obviously not everyone is succeeding, but at the same time, it gives you the tools to be successful. Like it's, it's in your control now. While before I was like, okay, like I, I want to be here, but how do I come from <laughs> where I am to here? It was just like a very, uh, and the even road in traditional art world to understand how to become successful there without connections. So once it clicked for you, how did you get started? What did you do next? Uh, well, first, obviously, I started applying to a bunch of platforms because I was thinking that was the only one way to get there. And later on, I realized that it's more about building a community around yourself, building a brand. So it doesn't really matter what platform are you on. It's more important how you present yourself, how, what stories you tell behind your art. Um, so actually now I mostly post on, I'm still bad at pronouncing it, on Hikat <laughs> Um And yeah, I think I'm going to post more on that because I really like the platform. It's quite experimental and it's fun. And there is like this spirit of creativity and artists collecting artists there. So I really like connect to that. Well, mm. let's, let's talk yeah. a little bit about your background and your brand. Uh, where are you from and how did you get into art? Uh, well, originally I'm from Russia, so I studied art in my university. So I started painting and drawing since I was 14, like professionally painting and drawing. So it's been uh, many years <laughs> since then. Um, I also like, I studied fashion design. So I worked as a designer for a long time and freelancing as a designer. Uh, and then several years ago, I got back to painting and I tried oil painting for the first time. And at that moment I was like, wow, this is so good. And like, I realized I became quickly, like relatively good at it. So I was just like, wow, this is something for me here. So I went to Barcelona and did an art program there and started taking part in the group shows. I went to London for a show and like I took part in some festivals. So it was very exciting and yeah. 
Uh, and then it slowed down for me because I was trying to figure out like, what is my thing? What art I want to work on? Uh, I started, like I caught myself that I started thinking what art I should make so critics and people from galleries notice me and so they will like my art, you know? So instead of thinking what I want to create, I started thinking, okay, like I need to create this edgy thing and like something about feminism or like, you know, like exploiting all the hot topics so people will like, so I get into the shows and I get noticed. So I was like, okay, this is, I don't like to think that way. Like I want to create what I want to create and not what, is popular right now That's so a very, it, like a very difficult choice for an artist it's it's yeah. easy to try to serve that market and to say well you know banksy's mm -hmm. popular i want to make art that's like banksy and yeah break through in that way and that just the the simple copying but then if you do that you're not expressing who you are and sometimes if you're not mm -hmm. expressing you it's not going to sell anyway even if it's a perfect copy of what the other person was doing i think it's much better yeah. to be original yeah, I think that's also like the thing in NFT world, because, for example, you can see certain types of artworks were very popular at the time, like few, several months ago, everybody was doing either 3D or all these astronauts. And you're like, oh, <laughs> maybe I should add some 3D to my work when in reality, it's not something that you create. So it's also like, yeah, it's easy to change what you're doing. Well, it was a long time ago now, but I used to tell artists, yeah just add a Bitcoin logo to your work, just put mm. the word Bitcoin on there. And I hated myself for saying it because I knew <laughs> that they would be just commercializing and just transform. Mm. Oh, this is a sunset, but the sun is a Bitcoin. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And, but, but still I was like, Bitcoin also buy this Bitcoin <laughs> got a couple hundred bucks, you know, they can buy some toys and some of them might buy art. And now it's so interesting because they're buying this digital art. They don't get anything mm. to hang on your wall. I've had to get a digital picture frame and a music stand here uh, mm. to try to display a little bit of the, the NFTs uh, that I've bought mm -hmm. uh, for what it's worth. And, um, but what do you think about, about this interest now in something that's real, but not real? Mm. I think it's really actually like getting a real display. It's kind of grounding this digital art because when it's existing in your wallet, like it, maybe it's a really good investment opportunity and you can flip it afterwards and you can resell it. But at the same time, if you really connect to art and you want to keep it for some time, you know, just put it on, on the laptop screen. I feel it's, it's a bit not enough. So it's really good to have a certain frame that will show it in your house somehow, or you can maybe even travel around with it if you're traveling. Uh, so I feel it's nice, but uh, at the same time, I understand for a lot of people, it's not that important. Like most of the people who are collecting now, they don't care about this part. Um, but NFT is basically I about ownership. So yeah, it's the same with, as with every collection. It's more about knowing that you own the original than anything else. <laughs> I do think there's going to be more interest in digital picture frames like this. And even though this is mm. this is a hack, this I just downloaded the images that mm -hmm. I you know, technically own and I put them in there. Yeah. Um, I think there'll be ones in the future where it'll be connected to the NFT mm. market and it'll say, oh, you sold this one, it, it's going to disappear. And oh, you bought a new one, it'll appear. Mm. And people will just be in their office. And this one's a little glossy. It's a little still a kind of a screen. But I think mm -hmm. they'll make really good screens that'll look kind of like paintings where it'll have like the you can see the canvas behind it, kind of that little yeah. pattern. I think they'll do that and they'll put these NFTs on there and then the people will fight over the expensive ones. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I know one brand that is launching their frames in September and actually it connects to your wallet. So they have an app that connects to your wallet and you can download, like you can show your NFTs through that. And I think it's a really good way to go. And maybe in the future they will be larger because right now it's like, I don't remember the exact sizes, but it's not too big. But I know like for like serious art, you want a large frame. So it's just like take a um, prominent space on your wall. Yeah, I'm starting to feel like I kind of want both. I want a large frame, like this is a 15 inch mm -hmm. and it's not quite the size of the art that I have. So that's kind of a bummer. Maybe they'll make better ones, but also mm -hmm. a little uh, digital small one to travel with. Like you're saying, you set up on a desk and you're like, oh, my magical art travels with me and uh, mm -hmm. shows up and you, you do a little updating. You could put the new ones on there. It's pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. So 
for some art that I collected that are stills, so I actually, like I looked at it yesterday, I was like, I want to print it out as a poster, like a large thing and put it on my wall because I enjoy it so much myself. Now, which way do you lean on NFTs? I mean, I see NFTs, some of them are very inexpensive and you can print mm. thousands of them and they're kind of like a promotion. And if I can get you to take one, like the, a flyer on the street, if I get you to take it, that's enough. Like I can put mm. this promotion in your wallet. I can make you think about my art for a second. And if my art's interesting, captivating, it brings you in and then maybe you become a buyer for a dollar or two. Or do you think that mm. NFT is like fine art and selling for thousands of dollars serving kind of a different market, uh, which direct, and obviously I think it can go both. It doesn't have to be either, yeah. but just which, which direction are you interested in? Which one of those ideas interests you more? Well, in my case, I'm more leaning into uh, like one editions or at least limited editions. I'm not so much of a fan of open editions when there is unlimited supply because yeah, but maybe it, like if you really like open editions, it's good to like give away one work like that. But I wouldn't, I think it's um, making the rest of the works less valuable if, you know, <laughs> if they look the same, but for some reason, one of them, you are just giving away almost for free. Um, but at the same time, there was this event uh, not so long at Hikunung for a weekend, every artist was putting their artworks for free there. And uh, like you mean a lot of editions and you just give away for free. So I think that was fun and I took part of in it. So I made like hundred copies of one of my piece and people were collecting it. Unfortunately, there were some bots. <laughs> so right now, like 80 of these works are grabbed by some bot who's reselling it. And I'm like, okay. Uh, but I think this is was really fun because it got a lot of people into understanding this feeling how it feels to collect works and that is actually so exciting because there were like so many great artists available for free but at the same time you like in my case I didn't take everything that was on offer I was trying to like I was looking at the work looking at the artists reading about them and thinking like if I connect to that so it gave get me into this feeling and actually after that yeah I picked up some works for um, like that were not free anymore. And I feel like, okay, actually, like I want to start my collection and start collecting too. See, I think that's the way that collecting works. And that's why it's such a powerful promotions tool mm. to be able to give some out uh, because you get them and you're like, oh, I like that. I could get more of those. Yeah. And especially a lot of artists work in series where it's a similar style or a similar mm -hmm. topic. And if you get that and you're like, oh, I, I like these, then you buy more and then it works out. But I do see what you're saying as well with having it being rare. A lot of people have described mm. NFTs as like an artist's signature. So if you were to design a piece and maybe it takes you months or years or a great amount of time to make the full piece, and then you make mm -hmm. one NFT as a signature and, and you're pretty clear in, in the details or whatever, I'm not gonna make this again in five mm -hmm. years. I'm not gonna reprint this every six months because it works so yeah. well. You know, which if you do that, you kind of destroy your reputation. So obviously you wouldn't want to do that, but you could maybe do it once. Um, so that's mm. always a possibility. But other than that, do you see it as a signature? What do you think of that interpretation of NFTs? Well, if we look at the art history, actually, like a lot of famous artists, they will be exploiting something. So, for example, with Claude Manet, he was also exploiting one theme and they will paint. I don't remember how many of like one uh, landscape he painted, but it was like 30 works. I don't remember exact number. <laughs> I don't want to lie here. There's so uh, many water lilies there. Big water yeah, lilies. Yeah, yeah, water lilies. Small all water like lilies the, the, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, so there will be all like Malevich with his black square. Actually, he made a bunch of that, with those because he's like, okay, black squares are selling well. So I'm going to do a lot of those. Um, so you can see historically that a lot of artists, they will be feeling like, okay, this sells well. So I'm going to make more of this or like Andy Warhol is <laughs> take, took it to extreme. So I don't think that right now it's so unique. It's just like art history repeating itself, but in a different medium. Uh, yeah, I think it's like a choice of every individual artist. Like for me, I, li I like the rarity. So I wouldn't want to do more than like 10 or 15 editions on of one work. 
uh, it still gives the opportunity for more people to collect it, but still it keeps it quite rare. Now, right now you said you were trying out different mm -hmm. platforms. Uh, we're going to go ahead yeah. and bring up uh, some of your work right here. So this is one of your works right now. Uh, it's called, yeah. it's called Dreamer and it's available on foundation.app. So yeah. Maybe tell us a little bit about the work first and then tell us about foundation.app and your experience there. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, not, so, not a good or bad or anything. Just, you know, we're curious Yeah, yeah. Um, talk about different platforms and compare them. To mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So about this work, this is my genesis piece. So that means that's my first work as an artist. And uh, yeah, when I put it out there, I didn't really, um, like I thought that you just put your work out there and it sells. And later on, I realized that no, you actually, you need to build connections with people. You need to build a community. So it's not that fast. Like, because there was this moment in time when they were selling so well. So a lot of people were just, you know, like throwing their works out there. But with this one, um, yeah, it's really precious to me because uh, it means a lot to me. So first of all, this portrait is my friend and she's an opera singer. And basically this work, it's made in collaboration with her. Like you don't hear sound now, but uh, she recorded her vocal for this painting. So when you watch it with sound, there is an opera vocal and I'm pretty sure it's the first NFT with opera <laughs> singer uh, and opera voice. Uh, so that's her and the symbols around my work is an alphabet that I created when I was 10. So I used to inscribe stories and write stories in this alphabet so nobody can read them. And now as an artist, I picked it up again. And now in every of my work, I use the symbols and they actually carry actual message. So maybe sometime later, some people will decipher the messages that I put in my work, but usually it tells about the intention of the work. It tells about the story behind the work. That's pretty great. It sounds amazing. And uh, mm -hmm. how's it going so far on the market? Uh, has it been, it's up for a reserve price of 0 0.3 Ethereum. Yeah. And uh, people can place a bid right now at foundation.app. Yeah, like with this one, it's been there for some time. And I feel like with uh, I didn't receive like much um, support from the platform itself, but I feel like there are so many people, it's hard for them to support everyone. Uh, yeah, maybe I should like, actually, like I put it down and you like, you need to really search to find this work anywhere since I'm focusing on a different platform, but maybe I should start promoting it again on Twitter after some time. Um, yeah, so right now, this one is just my only work there. And um, yeah, it's up for bits. <laughs> All right. And let's take a look at one of your other works here on Hick at Nook. Uh, what's yeah. So this one was uh, the work that I put for free for this uh, event over the weekend. And I minted uh, 100 something editions of it. And uh, it's called Duality. So this work talks about the duality of human nature that we both, all of us have like dark and light within ourselves. And you have like day and night, yin, yang, feminine, masculine energy. So it's about the balance of these energies and that like one can't exist without the other. So uh, like, in my in all the animations, I scan my actual oil paintings and then I process them with the um, software. So, yeah, so they can move around and make different patterns. It's actually a loop. Like I feel it's a bit lagging, but <laughs> it's a continuous loop. So it it plays on and on and on. Very cool. So there's actually a, a physical piece underlying this, and then you do the animations mm. on top. Yeah, like for most of the works. Yeah. All right. Let's look at this piece here. Uh, what's this piece? Uh, it's also, it's a continuous slope and it's also based on an oil painting. I was inspired by uh, romantic pain, paintings of 18th, 19th century. You know, they always have these dramatic back, backdrops of all this like dramatic sky. So I painted a sky like that and yeah, I processed. So, it, uh, so it's kind of like a hypnotic loop. It's more like a meditative piece, just like looking at it. <laughs> Very cool. And people can buy this with uh, Tezos on the Hick Ek Newt uh, platform. Yeah. Uh, how has that platform gone for you? How would you compare it to the other one? Mm, 
Mm, I feel it's much easier because when you put your work out there, it's on the main page. So even if you don't have any following, people can pick it up. Like for example, for this one, you can see it's all done. And yeah, I didn't, I didn't do that much promotion, but uh, somebody just saw it on Twitter and then uh, it was included in some review of recent artworks. So somebody picked it up from there. So I feel uh, for new artists that don't have a huge following, it's much easier to, you know, sell any works there. Now on Wax, they have a whitelisting process. Do they have anything like that at Hicka and Nook? Did they check out no. <laughs> like your artist profile or were you just simply able to post? No, you just, you connect your wallet and you can just post. Uh, there is a process to... Um, like when you just connect your wallet and post you're anonymous so if you want to fill out your profile and show your artist name in there you you need to write them like uh, to do fill some google form so <laughs> this website is actually pretty raw it's it's not that refined and professional looking like the other ones but i feel it's like what a lot of people like about this website because it's yeah it feels like the the early days <laughs> On, on one side, I can see that being good because there's less barrier. Mm. If you want to get started today, you can just yeah. get started and start putting up pieces. On the other side, do you worry about someone downloading your art and making an NFT of it? Well, there are cases like that, but <laughs> no, I usually I don't worry about that because I know people do that. Um, but first of all, like in this community, there there is like an instrument, a lot of people are reporting that if they notice that somebody is selling other people's work, they will usually like report him and block him. And it's not nice. And like, obviously, yeah, you can sell a couple of works, but it depends on what's your intention here. Like if your intention is to build an art career, why, why you want to steal some other people's work? Uh, you want to build a name around yourself. So, yeah. I usually am not bothered about it. Yeah, I think that's that's what a real artist would do and a person that wants to just use the platform as it is. Unfortunately, uh, with a mm. lot of internet technologies like email, uh, the spammers just come along. Mm. And if they crank out, you know, a thousand spams an hour and they sell one, uh, they do pretty yeah. well. And with an art platform, you just have to worry if they're cranking out a thousand Mickey Mouses an hour. Mm -hmm. and somebody buys one of them, not that Mickey Mouse needs any more money, but you know, it would be unfortunate <laughs> if the Mickey Mouse was, you know, my video or, uh, or your art piece, you know, there just has to, unfortunately, yeah. there has to be some kind of protection layer eventually. I'm sure they'll make one uh, for him, mm -hmm. but it just, at, at first, you know, that, that can be good and, and that can yeah. be bad. So, but I think it's a problem not only in NFTs. Like, for example, I worked in fashion and fashion is quite famous for copying all the designs. Like all the mass market brands like Zara, they will copy luxury brands. They will just take this and like take it apart. And then I was working in like a largest mass market brand back in Russia. And we were also like going shopping and just buying Zara and just copying them. So it's not only the problem of the art, like everybody does it and everybody does it in any parts. Like whenever you see a successful brand, people will copy the packaging. Maybe it won't be exact copy like an NFT, like they won't be able to download <laughs> the exact picture, but still like people are copying all the time. So I feel if you are just so much worried about people copying you, it just, it stops you from doing anything. Because instead of putting your ideas out there, you're like, oh, no, somebody's going to steal it. So I'll keep it to myself and you end up not doing anything. So what's, yeah. <laughs> it would also make a big deal to a collector. A real collector who found out their pieces were counterfeit would be like, oh, they're, mm -hmm. they're instantly worthless because they're not the connection yeah. with the artist. And my goal was to, you know, give the artist money to get the artist's signature, to have that, you know, mm -hmm. connection there. And if that connection's broken or it was counterfeit, it was a false connection. It felt good for a little while. And then unfortunately you didn't get the thing that you tried to buy. Yeah, unfortunately I know there were cases like that. Uh, I don't remember there was a, some sort of a collection when they put it out there sold for quite a lot of money. And then they found out that the founders of it didn't, <laughs> didn't know anything about it. So I know that some collectors actually burned their tokens for it because they were like, yeah, but this is not real. So, uh, yeah, I know this is a problem, but I think the only way is probably to 
um, to make personal connections with the artists and then you know that it's him because they confirm it. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I guess we're, we're at the very beginning still, so there will be new ways to deal with it. And uh, what kind of personal connections are you making? Are you doing clubhouse rooms? Are you hanging out on Twitter? Uh, what attempts are you making to build this community? Well, I really enjoy Twitter, honestly, uh, because I feel like there you can speak directly to the people and there is less barrier. Like back in the days when I was just doing a traditional art career, I was mostly using Instagram um, and uh, building my following there. But I felt there was less engagement there, like people were less interested to discuss actually art. They would be just kind of you know commenting like oh this is beautiful like you're beautiful what, whatever but on twitter people actually talk about things and i'm more interested in like philosophical discussions discussions about art about technology and just like to get in the whole vibe of like where it's all going so i enjoy twitter i'm in a couple of telegram chats I actually i found it like a telegram chat for russian artists on kikat nunk and first i founded it for and i was thinking okay it's going to be like 10 or 15 people there and we're just going to help each other out and like give each other advice what to do and now it's like more than 300 people there and everybody's supporting each other and buying each other's works so i'm very excited about this community that i built um yeah, so also Discord, but yeah, I have Clubhouse, but I feel it's overwhelming and there are so many different channels right now. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> I should focus on some of them and just like go with the ones that I like more. Well, I think you're right to go where you have the success. If you like Twitter, go towards mm -hmm. Twitter. And Twitter really is a conversation. Like you said, people will go back and forth. They express their opinion. Yeah. They like this, they don't like this. I definitely think you're going to find that on Twitter. I like I like Clubhouse as well, uh, but it is mm -hmm. just overwhelming and you spend all day in there and you have to go room to room to room. And and then at mm -hmm. the end of the day, you're like, what did I really do? Where did it go? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I'm not I'm not too much of a fan of the ephemeral audio where it just goes away. I prefer it if it's mm -hmm. a show and it goes on a thing and it stays there and people can watch it at other times of the day. Um, but Clubhouse yeah. is really good because you do get to talk to people directly. I'd say the same mm. thing for Twitter spaces or Telegram audio rooms. Uh, there's a lot to be said about having that conversation. And a lot of mm -hmm. people will be like, oh, I'll, I'll buy that art. I talked to the artist yesterday for an hour about, uh, you know, Monet paintings or something. Mm -hmm. people, people really like that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe at some point I will give it more a try. But so far I was just like, yeah, it's... It's a lot of technology and I think sometimes you can just spend so much time there that you don't have actual time to create <laughs> anymore. And uh, in the last few weeks, yeah, I noticed that I was studying more on technological side and working on uh, long term projects. So I wasn't putting much works out there and I was like, well, I wasn't really creating that much. I was just, you know, studying all the blockchain technology and understanding how you can actually innovate there, what you can do, because I feel that having a foundation knowledge is quite important uh, to understand the better picture of it. But yeah, but it, then it really doesn't leave you that much time to actually go and paint or like do something on your laptop. So I feel I still need to find the way to balance both of those. It's all about having a schedule. If you have a release date, if you have a deadline like every week mm. or every month or something like that, uh, you have a better chance of hitting it. But yeah, it's it's so nice to not have deadlines and just kind of mm. load along and do what you want to do, <laughs> uh, but you just don't get anything done. So yeah, I, I like the deadline style, but yeah, you'll have to see what <laughs> works for you. Yeah. So let's see, we have uh, one more of your pieces here. I think, like you said, this features uh, your language that you created. Mm. Is awesome yeah, that's alphabet. Nook. And uh, what else can you tell yeah. us about this piece? It's actually a piece of my painting. Maybe I will put the larger painting as one on one soon as well. Because as I said, like right now, I'm not putting much out there. But then I was like, okay, no, I, I need to get back to it and need to put out the works while I'm working on a bigger project at the same time. Uh, so yeah, that's a piece of the painting that I uh, originally, it has a lot of colors, but I decided to go into the darker colors and animate it 
all of these symbols. It reminds me of the matrix, how it all goes like this. So yeah, it's kind of like homage to the matrix mixed up with my alphabet. Very cool. And uh, we mentioned earlier your collection and that I have some of my collection here. Uh, any of these mm. pieces, uh, would you like to talk about uh, maybe why you bought them or which one's your favorite? Uh, there's a variety of pieces here just for the audio listeners. A lot of them look to be animated. Uh, a mm. lot of them seem kind of computer generated. Uh, what kind yeah. of art are you into? What what draws your eye as a collector? Well, yeah, they are all very different. Like it's interesting because I personally come from a more traditional background. So um, I'm very much into oil painting and I like going to museums and the shows and enjoying more like impressionistic art but when it comes to nfts i like the variety like i like both the 3d i like all this like trash art and uh pixelated pieces so yeah it's it's a big <laughs> it's a big variety but i think for me it's just um i'm a very visual person if i find something aesthetically pleasing i will get it so yeah it's more about uh if it catches my eye i guess I, I think my favorite here, I like the rad with the press yeah. button. That one's really good, like a video game. And of course, the I want to believe skull <laughs> in the corner is just really cool. But they, they all are very- Yeah, it's a funny one. And, and very modern. And uh, yeah, they all be, I think they'd be good wallpaper for a computer, uh, that kind of thing. They mm. just they have a nice uh, artistic and a eye-catching look to them. Uh, so thanks mm -hmm. so much, Yulia, for being on the mm. show. Where can people uh, check out your work? Uh, where can they learn more and do you have anything um, planned uh, for the near future yeah so you can find me on twitter i'll be happy to connect and uh yeah there is also my instagram but you can uh, oh i don't have the link to my instagram <laughs> i just found out on my twitter okay i should add it there uh so right now i'm actually working on a long-term project where um, I collect stories from different artists, collectors, developers, um, investors from the crypto space. And I'm researching the, the history of this space, the recent history of the space through a human perspective. So I collect personal stories about how people came across some opportunities and maybe missed them to like explore the fear of missing out, which is quite big in the space. Uh, so this takes a lot of time because I need to collect 100 stories and now I'm halfway through and uh, I'm looking for like very personal engaging stories. So yeah, it also <laughs> takes time and not everybody can open to a stranger, right? So like part of the stories are from my friend, but friends, but it will all be an anonymous. Uh, and in the future, I'm thinking of the best way to release it, um, but I'm aiming to present this project next month. Uh, we will have a physical show in Bali together with a show in the Central End. So I think I will present my project there next month. And yeah, that's one of the exciting ones that I'm working on right now. Well, that sounds very cool. And people can check your Twitter out right here. Yeah. Yulia Babanova one mm, on Twitter yeah. and uh, we'll put the link uh, in the description down below. Uh, thanks mm -hmm. so much, Yulia, for being on the show. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. This episode was sponsored by NFT Ventures Miami. Become an NFTV artist. Sign up today. Easy bit. Easy bit. Easy bit. Bitcoin ATMs. Easy bit.